to speak on the role of fair and impartial courts in Kansas. We are delighted to welcome the Honorable Karen Humphreys. Yeah. After more than 21 years of service, U.S. Magistrate Judge Karen M. Humphreys announced her retirement as of January 31, 2015. Prior to joining the court family, Judge Humphreys practiced law in Wichita, Kansas City, and Topeka following her graduation from KU Law School in 1973. Her diverse career includes stints in private practice, legal age, government agencies, and the U.S. Attorney's Office. In 1987, Governor Mike Hayden appointed her to the Sedgwick County District Court, where she presided as a trial judge until her appointment to the federal branch in 1993. The District Judges of Kansas appointed Judge Humphreys as the first woman to serve as a U.S. Magistrate Judge in the District. The court also designated her as the first Chief Magistrate Judge in 2003 based upon her outstanding professional contributions. One of her most notable accomplishments was the development of a specialty reentry court for individuals returning to the community on supervision after serving their criminal sentence. Her public service includes work as a director of the KU Alumni Association and the Federal Magistrate Judges Association. She has chaired the boards of both the Kansas Health Institute and the Kansas Leadership Center. Welcome the Honorable Karen Humphreys. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. That's a great uh, introduction. I'll be embellishing on it shortly. But um, I've got a story about Mike Hayden, but did they leave? OK, well, I'm going to tell the story anyway. But uh, in you, as you consider my qualifications to address you today, I hope you understand there is nothing in my 60 eight years of life that prepared me to follow that warm-up act. <laughs> Let's give them another round of applause. <clears throat> I found myself listening, captivated, and thinking I would give anything to have leadership like that in the legislature and in Cedar Crest. What most of you don't know is that I ran for governor once. I think I was 18 years old at Girl State. You know what, that's a, a civics uh, training session sponsored by the American Legion Auxiliary. And for some reason, this little kid from Ashland, Kansas, out near Dodge City, decided why not, uh, you know, go for it. So I ran for governor. And I lost by one vote, but I did vote for myself. <laughs> but the result of that, the, the benefit of running meant that I could then be a senator from the state of Kansas to Girls Nation. And on the train trip from Dodge City to Washington, D.C., I met a woman from the state of Washington. And she shared with me her intention to run for governor. I'm, I'm president of, of Girls Nation. And that kind of took the wind out of my sails because I was, you know, thinking about it, but I saw that she was a far better candidate, so I offered to nominate her for president of Girls Nation. I did, and she won. So you know how politics works. She came back to me. Now, remember, we're 18 years old, starting our senior year in high school, and she said, well, Karen, you can have any job in government that you want because... <laughs> Now, this is the weirdness. Uh, that meant I could have been on the Supreme Court. I could have been Secretary of State. You know, you go through the cabinet. I said, well, I want to be the director of the Peace Corps. <laughs> and what that meant is that I got to meet my counterpart in real life. And uh, Sergeant Shriver has been a hero of mine ever since that wonderful meeting. Which brings me to a second story. I'm sort of sorry that Mike Hayden has left because he reminded me of a, a pivotal moment when I was 
uh, probably a junior at the University of Kansas, and uh, Senator Robert F. Kennedy came to speak at KU, he also went to K-State. And uh, that was in Allen Fieldhouse, and many of you have seen fun times there. But in 1968, uh, Bobby Kennedy was a hero to all of the young people. And that field house was totally filled. And the aisles were full. We violated every fire code you can do. <laughs> and then he died at the hand of an assassin uh, just a short time after his appearance at the University of Kansas. Um, the, the topic for my presentation today is the role of fair and impartial courts in Kansas. And of course, Justice Lukert sends her warmest regards to all of you. And I wish she could have been here today because you deserve an opportunity to know her better. She is of the finest quality and deserving of your support. She and five other justices on the Kansas Supreme Court will be on the ballot in November for a yes or no on retention. And I want to start by saying the third branch of our government, the court system, is under siege. And that's how I would label my presentation to you today. I'll talk about the role of courts also. But we need to be, as Governor Carlin said, aware of the challenges that are being made to defeat and to not retain justices on the Kansas Supreme Court and on the Kansas Court of Appeals. They're uh, being infected by the same thing that the governors both mentioned, and that is this excessive partisanship. And before I continue, I want to single out my Caden for a special comment. <clears throat> In 1987, I decided it was time to take a career correction, if you will, and seek a judicial appointment. I had been practicing law in Wichita for a number of years. And at that time, there were very few women on the bench. There was one, and many of you will remember her name, was Kay Royce. And we needed more women on the bench. But there weren't very many women who had enough white hair uh, <laughs> had had opportunities in their practice to be eligible to be considered for appointments to the bench. But Mike was a brand new governor and there were four vacancies on the Sedgwick County District Court. And I decided, what the heck, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring. But I was a registered Democrat. And he was a brand new Republican governor. So you know what the politics are. I had an interview with Governor Hayden, and he talked about growing up in Atwood, and I talked about growing up in Ashland, and we really hit it off. And to his everlasting credit, he crossed over the partisan line and appointed a Democrat to the Sedgwick County bench. And that is what I owe my 28 years of a judicial career to is somebody who was willing to look beyond the party label and do the homework and figure out that <laughs> there he is and uh, I don't know if his ears are burning or not but I, I very rarely have an opportunity to publicly thank someone who did me a great professional courtesy, and I hope that I have honored your faith in me uh, for the last 28 years, Mike. Thank you. You know, I have sat in the audience listening to these governors. I have been moved to tears. And the reason I am so impressed by what we've heard today is that what they are really telling us as if we didn't already know that, is that our politicians need to be concerned about the common good and not special interests. And I hope that uh, all of you are as, as inspired as I am. And I want to thank this audience for doing such a wonderful job of the hard work of helping support candidates. I did retire last year. 
I was telling Mary that it's kind of hard to shed some of the skin that I developed about being restrained in my um, partisan views, if you will, or political views, how I view things, but I'm happy today to not be having to operate under those same judicial code of conduct restraints. So I'll speak a bit more frankly than uh, Justice Lukert would have been able to do, and I hope you will understand that I'm no longer subject to those conduct rules. And they're very important, and there's something that, there are things that differentiate judges from legislators, for example. Winston Churchill once said, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government except all the others <laughs> that have been tried. And what he means is that democracy is a human endeavor. It's an experiment. And never in the history of the world has this experiment run so long and so well. So we know and we agree it's better than the alternatives. And the same thing can be said about the role of independent courts within this democratic arrangement. Perfection cannot be the right measure for any human institution, including our independent courts. So the point of this is, if you disagree about a case that a judge has decided, one case does not make a judge. Judges, whether they're at the appellate or the trial or the city court level, decide hundreds and hundreds of cases. So don't measure your decision about the support of a judge on the basis of one case. During my career as a judge, I raised my right hand and I took an oath. And that oath is the same one that every judge takes. Let me remind you what it is. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and, this is important, the Constitution of the State of Kansas, and faithfully discharge the duties of my office, so help me God. That oath is so rich in content, and it's so simple, but what it does is reinforce for all of us who serve as judges in this important third branch of government, which is the smallest branch of government, the idea that this is a country where the rule of law, not the rule of men, is what is so important. And the framers of the Declaration of Independence, of our Constitution, and the Bill of Rights embraced the concept that we were built on the rule of law to get out of that English system that was so oppressive. And I will remind you that we, the people of the United States, in order to form and you know these words, a more perfect union, establish justice. That's the second thing in those wonderful words at the beginning of our Constitution. Thomas Jefferson wrote that the most sacred duties of a government is to do equal and impartial justice to all of the citizens, regardless of their wealth status or their poverty situation. Equal justice and impartial justice. Those should be the only tests that you apply when you decide to vote for someone running for a judgeship or to retain. Did that judge or justice do equal and impartial justice to all of the citizens? One more thought for your kind consideration from Sandra Day O'Connor. And I do remember when she was appointed by President Reagan as the first woman on the U.S. Supreme Court. She said the founders realized that there has to be some place where being right, being right is more important than being popular or powerful and where fairness trumps strength, no pun intended. <laughs> <clears throat> And in our country, that place is the courtrooms. In every judicial district in Kansas, in Topeka, in the Supreme 
court and in the Kansas Court of Appeals and in the federal court in the three cities in Wichita, Topeka, and Kansas City. This past February, our Secretary of State made comments to the Republican Convention in Overland Park. What he said were that there are five Supreme Court justices on the ballot for retention in November. He said four of those five should be voted out of their jobs. He said, tell your friends to get rid of them at the bottom of the ballot to vote not to retain them except for Caleb Stiegel, who is on the Supreme Court, and he is there for retention, and he was the former chief counsel to Governor Brownback. Now, I want to say the names to remind you of the other four justices, all of whom are deserving of our vote, yes, for retention. And please carry this message to your faith community, to your neighborhoods, to your schools, wherever you are. Their names are Chief Justice Lata Nuss, Justice Marla J. Lukert, Justice Carol A. Byer, and Justice Dan Biles. I will say that I've had the privilege of being professionally associated with all of these fine people, and you should not hesitate to support them. They meet every professional qualification you could expect of anyone serving in such an important position. Let me switch gears for just a moment. Uh, Esquire magazine in March of this year had a statement by the author that said if it were possible for the U.S. Congress to place a state into some kind of democratic receivership, Kansas would be a really good candidate. <laughs> a day later, uh, a publication called Daily Cause had a title, and you may remember this, Richard, for those who had any doubts, Kansas has officially gone insane. <laughs> I'm a lifelong Kansan. I have chosen to stay in this state for many great reasons. But to have these kinds of things being said about a state that I love and that I'm proud to call my home is distressing, to put it mildly. Kansas, and you need to understand, for all of this year is ground zero for this fight to preserve fair and impartial courts. And you are going to see literally millions of dollars being poured into the effort to unseat justices on the Kansas Supreme Court and on the Kansas Court of Appeals. I want to be very clear in case you have any doubt about this. Our Kansas courts today, and they always have been, are fair and free and independent. And those who serve on those courts take their oath of office seriously. They decide cases uninhibited by partisan politics and undisturbed by the clamor of the public. I've made unpopular decisions in my life as a judge, and I dreaded the morning newspaper after I did that, but I survived. And don't think for a minute that judges don't read the newspaper or whatever other social media uh, is available. When I started, there really wasn't any social media. But b make no mistake, those who are attacking our courts want to shape the courts to their own liking. They have a misguided idea that justices are a means to an end. This is unthinkable to me. And that it is appropriate to pursue chosen ends through the selection of judges who are committed to a particular agenda. Now, I quoted Chris Kobach, and I'm going to quote Governor Brownback now. Uh, this was in connection with the a school funding dilemma. And during a discussion with the Republican chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, 
Governor Brownback said, why can't you go along with us on this judicial selection issue and let us change the way we select judges so we can get judges who will vote the way we want them to? Just the facts. That's all this is, just the facts. Uh, fortunately, the Kansas legislature has not passed those bills, but there have been more than 80 uh, anti-judicial bills introduced in the legislature in the last couple of years. Make no mistake, this is a, a, a broad sweep to try to change the way justices are selected and appointed. The news from our state leaves many people outside of the state and inside our state wondering whether we will defend ourselves against an assault on the justice system. The real test will be November the 16th, excuse me, November 2016 retention election, which I've already told you, five of the seven justices and six of the 14 Court of Appeals judges will be on the ballot. So this offers a great temptation to the special interest groups and partisans who want to reshape the Kansas courts. The organized bar in our state, I'm very, very happy to report, is taking this issue quite seriously and doing appropriate planning and efforts to try to be ready for what's ahead of us. And if any of you are interested, it's called Kansans for Fair Courts. It is a 501c4 organization, and you should keep them in your thoughts in terms of supporting the effort to keep our courts independent. So um, enough about this. Maybe there's some questions that we ought to do. Jill. Mm -hmm. What is your response? We've got to be thinking about this. Yeah, we should. There's two issues, the school funding litigation, which, by the way, has been going on for years, and I know you know that, and then the Carr brothers. The Carr brothers in Wichita was so darn effective. Yeah. And when Governor Hayden says we've got to win Wichita, that commercial, uh, much as I hated it, was highly effective, and it's, this is easy to repeat them. Yeah. It was a, it's more of a comment, how will we respond to an advertising campaign that flashes the Carr brother fiasco in front of us? And it goes to my point, Jill, that that decision by the Kansas Supreme Court was based upon the case that was presented to them. Obviously, the U.S. Supreme Court disagreed and reversed it. It had to do with the death penalty, for those of you that may not have the familiarity. But you should be proud of that decision if you realize and appreciate and acknowledge that that's exactly what we want judges to do, is make decisions based upon the law as they interpret it. And they're not being political in making that decision. I'll guarantee you that the seven justices knew darn well what kind of political reaction this would generate. But they stood up to the challenge and they made the decision, which many of us may disagree with. And I, I'm not defending the decision. I, what I am defending is their right to make a decision based upon the law and the facts presented. Yeah. Right? No surprises here. And that group that's forming to have some response needs a more emotional response than the one we all, that's why we love you, because of what you're doing. But it needs to be, in my non-marketing opinion, <laughs> an emotional response. Yeah. So I just bring that to everybody's attention, because that has to be the commercial they're going to run. Do you want to come up here? No, you do it. Jill is, is um, I, I don't even know if I can. I can't help myself. 
<laughs> I'm happy to have company at the podium. I think the response of a marvelous judge and the thing we all know in our heart is so true about our legal system is a tad too intellectual. I think there has to be some emotional, guttural response because that Carr brother commercial is so powerful. I mean, those kids went to school with my kid. I knew all those kids. I mean, so there's not one person in Wichita that doesn't have that same response. So I hope whoever's responding statewide, and we all have to have an emotional response. Now, Ed, your response was what? You had a response. Do you want to respond? Yes. Come on up here, Ed Flengey. <laughs> you remember this discussion earlier. <laughs> I think it's very simple, and I wrote on this uh, a few weeks ago. I think the response is, don't let Brownback pack the courts. That's the bottom line. All right, it's all yours. Okay, back, back to the, uh, I, I just wanted to share one other um, place that you can go for information. For those of you that aren't acquainted with these justices and judges and you want to be better informed, you can go to a website called kscourts.org and you can read the biographies of every one of these fine judges and decide for yourself how you want to vote. I don't want you to vote because I'm recommending that you do that. You can throw that out with the wind. But do go to that kscourts.org and read up on these judges that are going to be uh, on the ballot in November. And I think they are uh, most deserving of your thoughtful support. Jill is right. There's going to be a horrific advertising and media campaign. And it's all going to happen, in my humble opinion, not being a politician, about a week before the election. And there are going to be millions of dollars coming into our state. Make no mistake about that. And uh, the, the group that is Kansas for Fair Courts are working uh, in a very high level and reasonably well funded. I don't know if there are millions of dollars there, but there's, there's a lot of money to support. So anyway, just remember, judges are not politicians and they're not legislators. Judges don't make the law. They interpret and they apply it. And I think there's a confusion that exists in our civic environment now about how, how they get to the decisions. They're not making up the law. They are interpreting the Constitution and applying it. They're interpreting statutes and applying it. And b believe me, they don't make an agenda for a legislative session. The cases that come to judges are filed by the people or their lawyers, and that's the work that they do. They don't ask people to file lawsuits, but they are there to decide the decisions and controversies that are presented to them. So any other questions? How do we counter the false narrative that it's the Kansas Supreme Court who wants to shut down our schools? This is a constitutional issue of immense magnitude, and the Kansas Supreme Court has been asked and will be deciding in the very near future to decide whether the bill enacted by the legislature meets the constitutional requirement. And Dave, help me with the standard for constitutional financing of the school system. It's magic words. What is it called? Adequate funding. Yeah. It sounds simple, and it's not simple, and it's very complex. And um, they are aware <laughs> that they are going to be on the ballot in November, five of the seven. 
But I can assure you of one thing, their decision will not be based on that fact. And I, I hope you will take my word for that because they've taken an oath to uphold the Constitution of the state of Kansas, and they'll do that. Do you favor reforming the Judicial Review Commission, and would it be helpful to encourage the retention of the six justices? The Judicial Qualifications Commission um, there's two things. One is one commission reviews complaints based on disciplinary problems, and just, judges and justices are subject to the Judicial Code of Conduct, and if it's felt that they have violated it, there's an investigation, and then that commission will recommend uh, removal from office, or they will recommend some sort of sanction. It doesn't happen often. Uh, but it does, well, I think the question is really talking about the Merit Selection Commission, and as it is composed, I think it's very well composed. The governor gets four appointments of lay people to that commission from each of the four congressional districts. Then there's one lawyer who is voted upon by other lawyers in that, in that or not judicial, congressional district, and so there's four lay people, four lawyers, and then there's a chair uh, who is voted upon statewide. But the Kansas Bar Association is not responsible for the makeup of the Judicial Nominating Commission. And it um, works at a very high level and is extremely uh, careful in, in scrutinizing the qualifications of judges. I might ask a question. How many of you have actually been in a courtroom as a juror, as a party, or as an observer. Practically everybody in the audience, and that's to be expected. And think about what your expectation was when you were in that environment about the judge presiding over whatever case was before the judge. You wanted someone who had good judgment, a good academic background, had experience, had a disposition that was fair and impartial, and that's exactly what should be uh, foremost in your mind when you decide how you want to vote in your local elections or uh, on the statewide ballot. This is our last question. Why are so many justices up for a vote for retention this year? <laughs> that's a good question. It's just one of the flukes of, of how the appointments are done. There's no real good explanation for it other than that. It's kind of a coincidence more than anything else. For example, Justice Caleb Stiegel was just appointed, so he has to be on the ballot this year for the first time. And the other four is just part of their six-year term, if you will, and so they're back on for uh, retention now. You have been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. <laughs>